Welcome, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna hand over immediately to our Dean, artist Madhavi, and uh, there's the last few people who are grabbing the food. Feel free to work your way through the line. Um, and I think there, there may be some, some couch seats back here if people want to filter in. Um, but anyway, Pardis, why don't you get us started and, and I'll introduce our speakers afterwards. Good morning, good afternoon, welcome. It's wonderful to see so many people here for such an important event. Um, my name is Pardis Madhavi and I'm the Dean here at the Corbell School. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our school, to Corbell, to the University of Denver. And for those of you who are joining us from out of town, welcome to Denver and to Colorado. Um, some of you know that today upstairs we're having an allyship summit and um, part of that spirit of that summit and, and the spirit that we've been trying to infuse uh, in our Corbell School is a recognition of a of, of place and of privilege and of power. And so um, I'd like to actually start today's event um, with an honoring and invocation of, of the land on which we, uh, on which we uh, are sitting today. So. Um, would like to first acknowledge that the University of Denver sits on Cheyenne and Arapaho land, who are the original stewards of this land, and to acknowledge all other tribes who call Colorado home. It is for their sacrifices and hardships that we are able to be here and learn. It is important to recognize that indigenous people are displaced from their homelands as we move into a time and a discussion dedicated to understanding how we can share and advocate for people from oppressed and marginalized communities every day. So, we like to kind of start some of our, our conversations with at least an acknowledgement of, of, of the land on which we sit and, and how that infuses our conversations and, and the learning that takes place um, here in our school. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this important event um, because Mexico and Colorado are joined by geographic, historic, dem demographic, and political ties. We are closer to Mexico than we are to DC. Uh, this is something that uh, I, I definitely identify with. Uh, I moved here just um, eight months ago from California. I'm from California, I grew up in San Diego, um, which is just 20 miles from the border, and I put border in quotes to acknowledge the kind of artificial nature in which borders are drawn, and also to acknowledge the fact that California, of course, was part of Mexico. Um, and, you know, growing up, uh, I think that many of us uh, Californians felt much closer to, to Mexico and, and, and um, in terms of our understandings of ourselves and our identities, and, and closer to that sense of self than to the East Coast. Um, one of the things that was so frustrating to many of us who were in elementary school and later high school in Southern California is that in the pedagogical approaches to understanding California history, oftentimes the history of violence was erased and the history of, of colonialism was erased, as well as the important work that had been done by the braceros and by so many Mexicans who continue to sustain California. And that, that was eclipsed in, in the knowledge production and the epistemology of, of our understanding of the relationship. And so I think it's so important to bring that back in pedagogically and, and why it's important to have events like this here um, at, at a School of International Studies so that we can sort of break that, that cycle of structural violence that perpetuates through epistemology, right? So for Colorado, the southern half of Colorado used to belong to Mexico until military conflict in the mid 19th century, at which point Colorado and the rest of the Southwest became part of the United States. For California, of course, it extended much further. For Mexican residents, it was a sudden and sharp change. They became foreign to a land that had been for centuries their home, sparking the well-known, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And I should just say, as, an, as, as somebody who's um, uh, from the Middle East, I'm all too familiar with borders crossing us, even today. Um, the people of the entire Southwest and Rocky Mountain region celebrate a Mexican heritage. The most important urban Chicano movement of the 1960s was based in Denver, led by Corky Gonzalez, and called the Crusade for Justice. We have, as a community scholar based in Latin America Center, one of the most prominent leaders of that movement and nationally known scholar, Ernesto Vigil. Is Ernesto here? Okay. Um, well, if, you, if we get a chance, we'll have to bring him back. Um, this collaboration highlights the role of the Latin America Center in connecting to the Latinx community of Denver and to Latin America. Rather than build walls, the Latin America Center seeks to build bridges to solve the shared challenges that appear on both sides of the US-Mexico border, artificial as it is. Such borders are meaningless when it comes to climate change, financial instability, and the decay of democracy. Such issues are shared across borders, and so we seek solutions that cross borders, and actually I think that build on collaboration rather than conflict. 
So as this panel will demonstrate, Mexico and the United States are interdependent. We need to learn from one another. And so in that spirit, I want to welcome our distinguished visitors and inaugurate this terrific event by handing it over to the Latin America Center director, Karen Schneider. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Pardis, for those uh, generous and important words. Um, I want to, to thank also World Denver is an organization in Denver that is partnering with us on this event and an event this evening and has partnered with us on, on other activities including an event that we had on Puerto Rico about two weeks ago. Um, I want to thank all of you and I see students and faculty and people from the community here and, and you know that's really what the Latin America Center uh, wants to be is, is a service. Uh, a, a, a gathering place for people from the community, for students, for faculty, for all who are interested in Latin America and committed to, to, uh, to learning about it. Um, I especially want to thank Peter Smith, uh, who is, is at the edge of our couch here, and, and he'll, he'll be moderating today. I'll say a few more words about him, but really this event is because Peter is our senior uh, professor in residence at the Latin America Center, uh, a very distinguished and accomplished friend and, and, and colleague. Uh, and when Peter pulls out his Rolodex and invites illustrious and prestigious people from Latin America to speak and to share with us, they show up because he has a lifetime of commitment to Latin America and to Latin American studies and people recognize that and appreciate it and I certainly do. Um, We've invited a, a couple of, of, of uh, friends from, from Mexico, uh, and this is consistent with one of the things that the Latin America Center really believes is important, and that is to bring people from Latin America to talk about Latin America. And so when possible, we bring people from Mexico to talk about Mexico and Mexico, Mexican politics. Um, and in all of our activities, you know, we're trying to deepen those ties that connect uh, Latin America to, to Denver and to, to Colorado. Um, I'm going to say a few quick words about our, our guests, and I'll start with Alejandro Moreno, uh, who is Skyping in generously uh, from, from Mexico City. He's a professor of political science at ITAM, head of, a public opinion, head of public opinion research at the newspaper Reforma, uh, earned his PhD in political science at, in, at Michigan in 1997, and has been pr principal investigator for major cross-national studies, including the World Values Project, Latino Barometro, uh, he's been a leader in, in the World Association for Public Opinion Research, WAPOR. Uh, he has nearly 100 scholarly publications, including 12 books and more than 1,000 journalistic articles. When his name appeared on the list of people who was going to participate, I got several emails that just said, wow. What a, what a coup that we can, we can really share with, with, uh, with Alejandro uh, Moreno, and, and so we're really grateful that, that he's here with us today, at least virtually. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Ana Rubias, professor at the, the Center for International Studies at Colegio de México, where she was director uh, from 2012 to 2017. She has a doctorate from Oxford University, teaches on international relations theory, Latin American, and especially Mexican diplomacy and U.S. and Canadian foreign policies. Her recent writing is focused on Mexico's changing position in Latin America and its policies towards Cuba and, and Brazil. Uh, we're really happy to have uh, Ana here with us, uh, us today. This is the first time that we brought her, but we're already enjoying it so much that I know that we'll have her again. Uh, and I can say that honestly because we now, we, I'm also introducing Guadalupe González González, uh, who is in the middle on the, on the sofa here. And this is the second time we've had her here just this academic year because we like her so much. She is a professor of international relations at Colegio de México and also uh, until recently at CIDE in Mexico City. Did her graduate work at uh, UCSD. Um, and around 2004, she founded a cross-national uh, uh, public opinion project, Latin America and the World, uh, with one of our colleagues who's here, uh, Mariano Torcal, is also very active in that, in that project. And we're hoping to bring that project in, in, in some ways uh, to Denver and make Denver a hub in the cross-regional public opinion research that, that, it, that is going on within this Latin America and the World uh, project. It's, come, it's set the standard for comparative studies of public opinion and foreign policy. Her areas of expertise include drug trafficking, political democratization, and U.S.-Mexican relations. I'll finish by introducing uh, our friend Peter H. Smith, 
Distinguished Professor Emeritus at UCSD, Professor in Residence at the Latin America Center at the University of Denver. He's an author or editor of nearly 30 books on Latin America, <laughs> published major, major studies of the Mexican ruling elite, of U.S.-Mexican relations, of drug tra trafficking. I should mention that the uh, uh, Modern Latin America book that he wrote uh, is now in its uh, eighth it's ninth edition. It's the one that I used as an undergrad. It's still used for undergrads to, for their introduction to Latin America uh, uh, course. Um, so Peter is, you know, is is an, an important person in Latin American studies and in, in understanding uh, U.S. Latin American affairs. He's been a visiting fe fe a visiting professor at Colegio de México, at CIDE, at UNAM, uh, the, the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Uh, and in 2013, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Latin American Studies Association, uh, an association which is the umbrella over all of us as professors interested in Latin America, of uh, which he was the president at, at, at a certain point in his career also. So anyway, we have a, a really great panel. Uh, I, I'm enthused to see all this, this uh, 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 interest from, from the public and from students and faculty. I'll turn it over to Peter to moderate the event, and we're going to start with Alejandro, because I know that he's on as good a connection as we can get, and we never know when we'll be. Thank you. Welcome. Well, first I feel like Donald Trump. I'm going to say, look at this crowd. It's the biggest crowd they've ever had in this room, and full of lustrous and interested and fascinating uh, colleagues and conversations. As many of you know, general elections for Mexico are scheduled for July 1, 2018. Voters will elect a new president to a six-year term, 500 members of the Chamber of Deputies, and 128 members of the Senate, all at once. It is a potentially winner-take-all kind of election. We don't know that it will, and there's a lot of fragmentation in the system. But nonetheless, it is an enormous election. It's the election for the next six years. And it really constitutes the institutional hardcore of the nation's political system. Competition is intense. Basic questions emerge. First, what are the issues? What are people talking about, fighting about? Second, who will win? With what consequences? Three, what are likely implications for US-Mexican relations? in this era of Donald Trump, and how will the Trump administration react to these developments? To inform us about these questions, we have this very distinguished panel of guests. I have asked each of them to keep their remarks to 20 minutes, um, where there will be time for question and answer afterwards. So we hope you'll all stay and be able to participate in these deliberations as they go forward. Our first speaker is Alejandro Moreno uh, at the University of Michigan Summer School. I had the honor of teaching a summer course. <laughs> Ridiculously, I had Alejandro as a teaching assistant. I mean, he knew so much more than I did uh, that it's uh, been a source of pride and embarrassment ever since. It's a great pleasure to see him and to welcome him to this panel and to introduce him to this group. Alejandro. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to Peter Smith for inviting me. I was also honored to be his teaching assistant back in my years in Michigan. That's a little while ago, I won't say how much, but he was also the editor of one of my first books, and I was very proud of that, so I am very thankful to Peter for all his support. And for his invitation today, it's an honor to be in a panel <coughs> virtually uh, I can see see them uh, really, but uh, with Anna and Wallet, two uh, academics, two women that I admire and, and follow uh, when when it comes to political analysis, international analysis, history. So, hello, Anna and Wallo, It's a pleasure to see you. Also, both friends like Mariano Porcal, who already uh, asked me to um, reply to his emails. But this is election time, Mariano, <laughs> and this is a busy time, and um, let's talk about elections. Uh, part of me thinks from the academic side, I am a professor at the university. I try to study elections academically, but I have been a public pollster for almost 20 years, so much of what I, what I see, I see it through the optic of a journalistic 
view, if you allow me the, 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 the reference. So I will combine both of them a little bit, uh, of course, not leaving the academic side entirely, but also starting with the journalistic side. And I'm going to ask the presentation, I'm uh, uh, going to be uh, uh, showing some, some uh, slides. Um, and the first one are some guiding questions for you to just know what I'm going to be referring to besides the points that Peter was uh, talking about. First of all, what are the polls saying about this election and how different is this election from the previous one or from the three uh, previous elections or four previous elections that are the ones that we have been able to measure through public opinion polls more systematically? A uh, big concern about uh, polls, how valid, how reliable are they? There is a lack of credibility in public polling, not only in Mexico, but in many countries around the world, including partly the United States. So how much can we trust them? More substantially, perhaps, we are one month through the campaign, two months still left. How likely are preferences to change and how they have been changing, actually, since the candidates were named? We have, and I will return to this in a moment, five candidates. And preferences have been changing. But interestingly, not in the way that most political analysts, experts, journalists, political pundits in Mexico were expecting. They have been changing in a way that was, I would say, mostly unexpected just a few months ago. And this is kind of breaking the general expectation that there was in, 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 in the common sense about elections about having Mexico having an informal runoff election. We don't have a runoff. We don't have a second round. The winner of the election is the one who gets the most votes. However, because in, 2000, in 2006 and 2012, there has been a contested election between two front runners, we believe that there is sort of an informal runoff election where the strategic voting plays a very important role. What we're looking at in 2018 is that this might not be the case, but many of the schemes, many of the points of view, both academic, journalistic, but also political, we're expecting that behavior among the electorate, which we are actually not observing. Another question is, what are the demographic and regional, regional patterns of support for it, the main candidates? This as a way to give you a sense of where support comes from and what are the issues that these voters care most about? What is driving this election? Finally, we had just a few days ago uh, the first presidential debate of three. This is something that is discussed in campaigns effects, how, how, how much effect do, do debates have? And do we expect them to have large effects as we have seen in recent elections, or, or not so recent, especially since 1994 when we had the first televised presidential debate in the country. Finally, July 1st is a lot We'll have a lot of more elections rather than the president. We will review Congress in both chambers, deputies and senators. There will be nine gubernatorial races and many, many uh, hundreds of local races for mayor and, and uh, local congresses. I will not talk with detail about all those, but at least make a few references to them. So having said that, I will go to the first slide which is a graph, it's called aggregating public polls. I cannot see it from here, but I hope that you, you, you have it. And what I do here is to aggregate all the published polls that have been uh, in the media uh, for the last few months, especially those that are national level polls, and also conducted face to face. We also have some people doing telephone polls, Facebook polls, internet polls. These are basically household face-to-face -face national surveys. Um, as you can see, th this is the dirty way to look at it because uh, it jumps a lot. These are not campaign effects. These are mostly um, uh, uh, 
bolster effects. These are these are polls that are more favorable to one candidate, polls that are more favorable to another candidate, and as you can see, it sort of jumps, but it must, it's mostly the, the polling effects, the, the house effects. What we get from this graph is that from, from more or less from the end of the year, if we go back a year ago, or even uh, eight or nine months ago, this looked like a more contested race. This looked like it was going to be a three-way race that suddenly, or, or little by little, was going to be getting into two front runners, as it happened in the three previous presidential elections. However, and I'm going to go to the next graph, which is just a, a softening of these uh, 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 trends. This is a rolling average, very basic uh, rolling average, no, no, no specific or particular statistical treatment. What you can see here is that we have had one front runner, which actually keeps growing as we get closer to the election. Uh, two candidates, uh, uh, in this case, Lopez Obrador, the front runner from the leftist coalition, Morena PT, and not so leftist Encuentro Social, which is the, the, an evangelical based small party. Ricardo Anaya, who is the candidate of the coalition between PAN and PRD, center right and center left, that have allied in state elections to try to beat the pre and get the PRI out of government. It has worked in many state elections. Of course, the PRI candidate, this is the ruling party that is running third right now, as you can see the latest uh, rolling averages of the polls. Uh, for much of the so-called pre-campaña, or before the campaign, and the inter-campaña, which was sort of like the period between the pre-campaign and the actual campaign, they believed that it was important to define a second clear place, a second uh, place in the polls, so they could start working towards the, let's, hope, let's call it, final uh, uh, contest with López Obrador. However, as you can see, I, I, I don't see a contested election yet. We have a, a lonely front runner that, as I said before, seems to be growing as the other two either grow and fall back again or keep falling as in the case of the people. Then we have two other candidates, Margarita Zavala, uh, as an independent, she left the PAN, as you, many of you probably remember, and Jaime Rodriguez, uh, uh, nicknamed El Bronco, who is or was uh, uh, governor with license of Nuevo León, the first independent candidate who won a governorship back in 2015. In fact, with, a, with an election that surprised most of the observers and also surpassed the capability of polls to measure accurately what was a very, very rapid uh, um, increasingly uh, 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 gaining support as an independent candidate. So, um, Bronco is not shown here, but it's slightly under uh, Margarita Zavala, as you probably remember from the, from the previous graph. Let me make a pause here and think that um, unless Anaya, who is uh, getting into a clearer second place uh, as opposed to the ruling party uh, uh, pre uh, uh, Jose Antonio Mi, unless he grows substantially, we don't have the scenario of a, of a runoff election. This is looking and look, this is looking more and more as something that we have not used analytically in Mexico. I don't remember any election studies, either in academics or in journalistic terms which has used the term landslide election in our country. But for political experts and pundits in Mexico, I think that perhaps this analytical term, if it makes sense, it makes a lot of sense to you, uh, we could probably start thinking about its likely use if the current trends continue in the following two months. And when I say landslide election, which I don't have to explain much here in this audience, uh, as, as I have to in, in, in my Mexican audiences, because we have not had the concept. Uh, when you think about 1936 and think Roosevelt and the final, well, that was a, a landslide election, or think about some others, we have not had something like that. 
perhaps 2000 when Fox won might have been it, but it was a contested election, it was close, and it was also very surprising that at the end Fox would, uh, would be the winner of the election. Uh, where is all this support coming from and, and what is causing it? Uh, Lopez Obrador is um, having its main strength among younger voters, interconnected voters, voters that are urban, much of the middle classes, and also he is unusually strong in the northern states of the country where he has been historically much weaker. So this is this is a movement that I, uh, I, I I'm sorry to say the movement that, that Morena is called the Movimiento Movement of Regeneración Nacional, but it's also a movement because it seems to be an electoral machinery. It's not a political party in all its extensions. I, I know that this may create some academic discussion, but but this this is an electoral machinery that seems to be working. This is a four-year-old party that. Uh, performed relatively well in the midterm election in 2015, has been close to winning important states as it was the case last year in the state of Mexico. And now, to use the term again, is approaching the possibility of a landslide election in Mexico, which means also the possibility to, to bring Congress with him. We have not seen a Congress where the winning candidate for the presidency has won the majority since 1997 when the PRI lost the majority in the, in the lower house of Congress. Uh, so in the last 20 years we have had divided government. I think that one possibility is to start thinking about how likely it is that Lopez Obrador would, would win it all. Now, this is not definite. The Mexican electorate, and I will pass to the next slide, has been very volatile. In 2012, a panel study that we conducted at a time with colleagues from Harvard, at the MIT, and other universities, showed us that one out of two interviewees, one out of two voters, if you allow me to make the, the generalization, changed their minds during the election campaigns. This is about half of the electorate. Some of that changing their minds was cancel, canceling each other out, but it also made the 2012 election particularly interesting. In similar panel studies, we have seen also lots of volatility. This graph is in Spanish because it's the cut from a newspaper. Uh, by the way, I just, just in parenthesis, I was uh, a pollster for newspaper format for about 15, 16 years. In the last two, three years, I've been uh, publishing in El Financiero. This, this particular graph comes from a poll that we published in El Financiero in last March. What I want to show you is that in March, about 42% of the respondents at the national level told us that they had decided their vote, definitely. 17% said, well, I have some idea of who I might vote, but I still could change my mind. And about 38% said, I still have not decided. So if you put together the undecided and those who might change their minds, we are talking basically about a majority of voters who are unstable in, in their political preference, who might change. And this is more or less consistent with the panel findings that we had in 2012, where about half of the voters were changing their minds during their campaigns, at least once, because sometimes, and we have kept track of this, sometimes some voters keep change their minds several times. What happened, and this I will go to another uh, uh, two graphs from a, a newspaper uh, presentation. This is back from 2006. This is the swing in preferences that we observed back in 2006. Not with the aggregation of polls. These are the polls that I personally conducted uh, with the team of, of uh, uh, public opinion pollsters at Reforma. And as you can see from a scenario where we had one front runner at the beginning of the campaigns, Lopez Obrador, this changed substantially. We're talking about, you know, six point, uh, 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 if we take Lopez Obrador, highest point in March, he uh, uh, lost eight points in, this, in the largest swing during the campaign. 
And if you look at uh, Felipe Calderon from 30 to 40, he basically changed the points. We're thinking nine or eight points and 10 points, one way to another. The difference that we're looking at right now are larger than 2006. So to what extent we could see the, the, the magnitude of change that, we, uh, that some of the observers were expecting. The next slide will tell you about how the experience in 2012 was. These are again the reformer polls were, which were among the ones that were giving uh, the then front runner Enrique Peña Nieto the lowest advantage. Most of the polls were giving him 15 to 20 points, which ultimately did not happen. The lesson from 2012 is that the front runner was way overestimated, in some cases up by up to, to 10 percentage points. Uh, is there a possibility that Lopez Obrador is overestimated? Yes, there might be a possibility, except that part of the explanation and the reasons that voters give us of why they are opting for Lopez Obrador, one of them is anger, frustration, uh, um, the topic of corruption, the topic of uh, inequality, poverty, issues that he has been uh, using and, and uh, polishing for, for, many, for many years. But even in 2012, we saw these this, uh, important uh, changes during the campaign. Again, both in 2006 and 2012, and I could also include 2000, the changes looked like they were making the race much more contested. The changes that we're seeing right now are making the race looking less and less contested. So that's a big difference. This is not 2006 all over, as many many observers have, have uh, mentioned. Um, I will change the, to the next slide. And here, you will immediately notice that I'm changing to an academic uh, format. Uh, uh, not only because this is part of a new book coming up, but also because we go from color to black and white. <laughs> um, this, this graph shows you a significant partisan alignment in Mexico. This is part of the explanations of the increasing volatility in the Mexican electorate. Why we're seeing so many changes from uh, the partisan share of the electorate that used to be about 70% uh, 20, 25 years ago, it is now well under half. So the nonpartisan electorate, the independent electorate, has grown significant, significantly, and now it's the majority of the voters. And when I say the voters, I mean the voters, not just the electorate. The next, the next slide shows you in the, um, uh, the exit polls that we have conducted, national ex level exit polls during presidential campaigns how the share of non-party, uh, non-partisans has grown significantly, and I would expect in 2018 these to be possibly the majority at the polls. What this means also, uh, not only in terms of volatility and less attachment to the parties, less partisan loyalty, but also a growing segment of voters who decide at the last minute. In 2000, we had under 10% of last minute voters. It grew to around 15% in 2006, and it was close to 20% in 2012. Given that trend, uh, it would be very feasible to expect over 20%, perhaps one out of four voters on July 1st deciding their votes at the last minute. This means the week before the election or on election day. So, where will they go, these late, late minute voters? The strategic voting expectation that experts on Mexican elections have is that they will go to a candidate. Uh, for example, it went to Calderon in 2006. It went to Peña in 2012. Of course, it went to Fox in 2000. And some people would expect that it would go to a candidate like Anaya in 2018. I have my doubts. Anaya is growing at some point, but also uh, reducing the support. It's sort of like a bouncing uh, a trend uh, from the beginning of the campaigns. And most of the support that the pre-candidate has been losing 
even before there was a candidate, has not translated into support for the pan-PRD coalition, but to the Morena coalition. So it is difficult and it's hard to expect that the strategic voting will work in the same way. Um, just two more slides, I'm about to finish. I want to show you also something that you may know and be aware. Uh, presidential approval in Mexico has been breaking low records. It went down to almost 12, 13 percent at the beginning of uh, uh, the previous year, and it has been sometimes under 20, 20, 25 percent. And this, of course, is one of the major reasons why the election in 2018 is getting the look that we're seeing in the polls. There is a, a, a very high level of dissatisfaction with the current government, uh, presidential approval. As you can see from other presidencies, had never uh, been so low, and especially not during presidential elections. But, so this is quite problematic for for for, for, for the party in government. Um, this is one of the graphs. The next slide, uh, which shows an ideological space. This is one of the graphs that I use in my classes to show students more or less where the voters are. You can see movements of the average, the, the, the median voter from one election to the next in 2006 and 2012. My impression that for 2018, this has been polarizing. We have a very polarized uh, political environment. There might be centrifugal, if I can use that word, movements away from the median voter, both in the pre, uh, perhaps the, 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 the Lopez Obrador option. And it will be very interesting to see how this works. This map, by the way, is constructed using the World Value Survey data from Mexico, which is currently in field work, uh, so we will have this data very soon. Uh, let me finish just by showing you a graph, the last graph, of how last March, because this is the last publication I had at El Financiero, the races for Congress look. Uh, as you can see, one third of the national share of the vote goes to Morena, uh, as Lopez Obrador has been growing in the last uh, weeks, this may have grown already. The threshold, and perhaps uh, Walu might talk more about this, I'm not sure, but the threshold for a majority in Congress is 42% plus at least half of the electoral district. So how likely this is to happen? Well, going back to my provocation of 2018 as a possible landslide election, it could be possible. Now, just to close, what, what do I see in terms of the states? Nine gubernatorial races. The pre governs two of them. They might be able to keep one and perhaps contest another one. So in the best of cases, the governing party, despite the bad performance at the national level, might be able to keep one or two uh, governors races. But the way things look right now, uh, remember that pollsters have a, uh, uh, are short-sighted in terms of their forecast. We cannot go farther than this Sunday because the question we ask is, if this Sunday were the election, who would you vote for? Um, the Partido Verde, which is part of the national coalition of the PRI, governs once, Chiapas. Uh, the PAN governs two, plus another one with, uh, uh, in coalition with the PRD, Guanajuato, Puebla, and Veracruz. I think they're very likely to keep the first two, but not necessarily Veracruz. And Puebla might be contested as well. And the, I think that the main potential loser of the gubernatorial races might not be the PRI, but the PRD, who governs Morelos, Tabasco, and Mexico City, and it looks like they may be losing the three of them. The PRD, which was once the strong actor of the Mexican left of the spectrum, it's, it basically has become uh, uh, one of the small parties. I think I would leave it like that. Um, uh, I know that I've taken perhaps more time than I should, but I'd be happy to listen to questions and to listen, of course, to my colleagues to engage in the discussion. Thank you so much. What a dazzling presentation. Our next presentation is from Guadalupe Gonzalez and talk about the meaning 
of this election and elections in Mexico and Mexico for Mexican society and Mexico's future. Pardon? Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? No? Okay. Um, I want to thank you for the welcoming uh, words and for having such a crowd today, mm -hmm. which means that there are very interesting things happening in Mexico. And I'm, and, uh, I'm going to give you some information that uh, uh, makes this true. Uh, so I'm, on, I, I, I'm going to organize my, my presentation around four uh, questions. The one uh, is, uh, why is this election so important? The second one is, what's the legacy of current administration? because the next president is going to face what is left. <laughs> and third, um, which are the issues and the uh, po uh, public policy agenda in terms of the candidates and citizens' concerns? And what's next? What, what's to expect? Uh, there is still too soon, I could say, to, uh, to see whether this is going to be a landslide um, uh, election or not. Things might happen. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to take that into account at this point. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, more on which are the challenges ahead and which kind of um, uh, contextual uh, and institutional constraints any next president will have to face. Okay. So the starting on how this um, election is important, could you? Uh, my colleagues have already said that this is the largest election. There are more than uh, 18,000 political posts in this period. So this is a huge thing. This is the mother of all elections. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that's important. But there is uh, another um, take of this. This election is also particularly important because it is testing the latest uh, electoral reform that passed in 2014. And this is a very important um, uh, reform because for the first time, it allowed legisl legislative election. So for the for first time, the senators and representatives and local legislature elected in 2018 might be reelected for two and four consecutive periods. So in this election, what happens in Congress is going to be key for the future uh, of the country. This is a major uh, change. Uh, second, um, the, uh, the, the reforms um, introduce flexibility for creating uh, coalitions, electoral coalitions and uh, coalition governments. That's why this uh, election, the candidates are not running through their party la labels, but through a broader election. So one of the main questions when we want to look at the future is whether these electoral uh, elections are going to stay there when any election gets into power, because these are fragile elections. So that's one of the main questions. Second, um, this um, the new uh, the electoral reform um, introduced some changes in the regime of uh, political parties in Mexico in the sense that it uh, increases the electoral uh, threshold. This means now, now all the parties have, uh, can uh, be registered only if they uh, keep the third percent of the valid vote. This means that we might see less volatility and fragmentation in the future. Uh, uh, some of the, the, the small uh, parties were about to disappear in 2012, and now they are going to be there. And they are, they are going to play a very pivotal role when in, in, in Congress, because uh, we really don't know whether the electoral um, uh, 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 coalitions are going to hold together when they come into discussing the important issues. And these small parties are going to be key 
So, and they are going to uh, ask for a good payment for the collaboration. So that's another important thing. And um, we also have, for the first time, provisions regarding popular consultation. Now it's going to be uh, 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 possible to have uh, uh, referendums, although these referen the referendums might be called either by the president or one third of two cham chambers or the 2% uh, of re registered citizens. This means that we might have in the future more direct democracy type of mechanisms in Mexico, which can lead uh, to a, a scenario where um, a president and a Congress do not agree, the president or the Congress might go out and ask for the people vote. So let's watch about that kind of thing. Please. Um, what's at stake in this election? As uh, Alejandro said, we are in a completely new political scenario. Uh, the possibility of a landslide victory um, might anticipate some policy shifts. The question is how uh, radical or reformist away from market friendly policies that have been on hold over the last four decades. Uh, so economy policy continuity is far from guarantee uh, since a left candidate is leading the polls. Um, there is another thing that is important. In this election, the US is playing a role because of NAFTA uh, renegotiation and because Trump anti-Mexican discourse. These two things are pushing uh, ahead the um, uh, AMLO candidacy. And uh, these two factors add uncertainty, so we are going to, to see lots of vol economic vol vol uh, vol volatility. And the other consequence of uh, the, the, the US factor is that economic and bilateral issues have moved at the center of the electoral campaign. The most important consequence from my perspective uh, uh, from this election is um, are going to be seen in the Mexican party system. Mexico came from one party system into a three-party system and then became more fragmented. Another question is whether the new left party, uh, Morena, might be able to transform from being uh, a movement to being a solid party. And we don't know what, what will happen there. And that's also uh, going to have happen with the, with the a right party, the PAN, because it is split it. In this election, uh, Margarita Zavala, uh, who was uh, 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 ruling the party, and he, he is the ex-first lady, decided to uh, uh, run as an independent, and that has divided the, 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 the party. So what's going? Uh, are we going to see a, a frozen three parties? or we really don't know. So this, this, this election is going to change the uh, Mexican party system. And the last thing that I, I want to highlight is the fact that in this election, social networks and big data, um, all these new uh, mechanisms of participation are playing a key role. With, and we have no clue uh, uh, which might be the consequences. So that sounds a little bit similar to the US. Please, next one. Okay, there are some legitimacy risks. Although if uh, 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 Lopez Obrador wins, uh, uh, has a, a landslide uh, victory, that might be in, not as important. But in the context of an increasingly fragmented political landscape and no second round ballot, the next president could be elected with as little as one third of the popular vote. We don't know yet what is going to happen, but if the, if, if the campaign uh, close more, we might have this kind of uh, uh, 
minority uh, president, low, low legitimacy. Uh, on the other, uh, there are other two important aspects of the of current political landscape in Mexico. Up to this point, what we have been seeing, and you can see the graph there, counting the effective number of parties in Mexico, um, we have been witnessing increasing political fragmentation. Uh, po political parties have been. Uh, there are more new new players uh, in in the, in the political arena, and traditional parties have been uh, uh, fractured. Um, we have nine registered political parties uh, or party labels, but we at Congress, this is uh, uh, representation in Congress, almost six uh, effective number of parties. The question here is whether this. Uh, trend is going to follow from this election, and we really don't know. I, I would like uh, 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 Alejandro to talk a little bit about that because I, I don't have enough information. And second, there is growing citizen discontent with democracy. Um, Mexico has the lowest level of satisfaction uh, with democracy in Latin America and uh, support for democracy is going down in general, also below the Latin American uh, uh, panorama. Um, we are also seeing an erosion of the three traditional parties. The PRD, who was the strongest left-wing uh, party, is now very small, a tiny, tiny uh, party, because the new left, Morena's party took all their electoral with 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 him with it, and this is a very small a new party. Okay, uh, the PAN is divided between Calderonistas and Anagistas, and uh, the 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 PRI is divided. There are many different cleavages between the PRI, and if they lose. Uh, they, uh, it looks that they are going to lose. I could foresee uh, maybe uh, that the PRI might collapse, collapse in some areas in Mexico. Um, they are divided between the old guard politicians and technocrats and many different regional groups. So they are in real trouble. The next one. Uh, this is another way to look at the political space. Uh, here I introduce the international um, uh, dimension of it. And uh, this, is, this is not based in data. This is based just in uh, the political discourses. And when you can see that we have most of the parties and the candidates are on the globalist side of the uh, spectrum. This means that, from at least from my uh, perspective, that NAFTA is not in danger. Uh, in, it's not in, in, in danger yet. And um, I've been conducting some um, surveys, and I'm certain that there is um, a free trade um, a positive attitude among Mexicans which is uh, around 70% of population, like the market, they like liberal uh, uh, li uh, uh, trade liberalization, and they, they, they do like uh, foreign investment. Okay, so how, which are the, um, this uh, government legacy? Um, this is, Pe the Peña Nieto history is just the history of a tragedy, <laughs> because it started um, as a very promising moment for Mexico, actually he was able to put forward a very transformative uh, uh, agenda. He passed uh, 11 constitutional changes in the energy sector, education, fiscal, tele telecommunication, labor, finance, economic competition, and electoral reform, 
a change in the penal system and in the transparency system. So th that's a lot to do. And he did that through a political pact. So he was able to bring into this, uh, for making these reforms possible, the left, the PRD, uh, his own party, and the right, the PAN. So that's a huge achievement. However, something happened by by the, the by the, his uh, second year, many things went went wrong. Poor implementation because there was a, a resistance, corruption, but by uh, bad timing, for example, because uh, oil prices went down. Uh, so and many and some other uh, administrative errors. In balance, his uh, positives were overshadowed by his negatives. And the most important negatives came from uh, insecurity, um, moderate or disappointing economic growth, and first of all, corruption. So now I'm going to, the legacy is uh, an, a very angry electorate because of these three things. Please skip this one and this one. Okay, what are the citizens' agenda? Social justice. In a social uh, uh, economic inequality in Mexico is just so high. Second uh, uh, is security and uh, violence, corruption, and economic stability. Those are the things that the electorate ca care most. But also they do care about human rights and minority rights and education. But what is driving this election are the first four uh, issues. Could you put, okay, I'm going to, to wrap up here because I don't have enough time. But uh, what is this election about? There are many interpretations of the election, but I would say that this is a um, um, dispute between anger and fear. And the question is well, how this anger and fear is distributed, okay? Elites and the private sector are truly um, uh, worried about key reforms just sent away, while the people is much more angry than uh, uh, fear. Uh, because of the uh, economic and the insecurity situation in Mexico. Um, so um, here are some of the uh, policy uh, options that the candidates are uh, putting uh, into, the, into the debate. And what, it, what matters mainly is that, in fact, what we, there are two important changes from the Morena uh, uh, policy uh, proposals. One is the ener uh, energy reform. He has said that he might uh, reverse that, but he, but it, it will, he will need uh, two thirds of uh, the vote in Congress, while majority in all the state uh, Congresses. So that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, but what might happen is the changes that he is uh, um, uh, promising in uh, welfare and security policies because he is planning to uh, uh, change uh, public spending, to boost uh, public investment, mainly in infrastructure, and uh, also to uh, increase some of the uh, uh, cash transfers to targeted uh, uh, vulnerable people. And so he, he might be creating his own uh, popular base uh, if he is able to, that, to do that. The problem is that he might not have a majority in Congress. Second, uh, the other uh, problem is that his coalition is quite weak ideologically and politically. Third, he has no the machinery to stay in at, uh, at local level in, 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 in parts of, the, of, of, of Mexico. And uh, he might have 
to decide whether to um, stick to, to, to move towards a more pragmatic government or he might decide to um, make some <coughs> divisive moves and that might increase social polarization in Mexico. So I did it here. Thank you. thoughtful, insightful, clear, and provocative presentation. The final statement is from Ana Covarrubias, who will talk about the implications of all this for U.S.-Mexican relations. Ana. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, a very uh, quick thank you to the University of Denver and, of course, the Latin American Center and Professor Peter Smith. I'm very pleased and honored to be here. So I will speak um, answering the questions that Professor Smith sent me, and I will go from foreign policy in general to more specific implications for U.S.-Mexican relations, or what the candidates are saying about U.S.-Mexican <coughs> relations, and a very brief note on uh, the, U the, the U.S. government that surprisingly has not been very vocal so far on the um, uh, election in Mexico. So the first question is, well, uh, uh, Guadalupe has said a little bit on this and a little bit on my, my following section. I will confirm most of what he, she has already said. But the first question is why foreign policy in general is not a major theme in the election campaign? Uh, is that a lack of consensus or a lack of interest or what, what's going on? And what I can say, and probably Guadalupe can say a little bit more in the discussion uh, part, is that usually foreign policy is not a major topic in Mexican elections in general. I mean, it's not really um, something that the people would be interested in uh, discussing. Um, secondly, um, it is perhaps more important in this election, just as Guadalupe said, because of Donald Trump. Donald Trump really is now the, the major actor who has entered the Mexican um, election. And third, which already Guadalupe has said, other issues are more, more uh, pressing, insecurity and violence, corruption, and economic difficulties. Um, secondly, what are the candidates saying about, in terms of foreign policy? Uh, in, uh, here I will, I will uh, uh, share with you what they have been saying in their platforms, what they registered in the uh, National Electoral uh, Institute, INE, <coughs> and what they have been saying, especially during the seminar that we had at El Colegio, I think it was last week, where the candidates sent their representatives, and we did have some discussion with them, and they said very briefly what they're thinking about doing in terms of foreign policy. Uh, and just one a warning, candidates and the rep their representatives are not necessarily consistent in, in their <laughs> positions. They say something on Monday, then they might say a completely different thing on Tuesday, and their documents say a completely different thing. But I will try to make um, a generalization. And basically, we have two narratives, which is the last slide, or the, the, the previous one uh, that we, we saw. Uh, we have two different views of the world and of Mexican foreign policy. The first narrative would be the Frente, that is a PAN and PRD, the Coalición, which is led by the PRI, and Margarita Zavala. And here I have to confess that I'm not taking the Bronco into consideration because he was not supposed to be on the electoral um, ballot. He will be for reasons I disagree completely with. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not uh, taking him into consideration. So I'm just taking the major um, candidates here. So the first narrative by Frente, Coalición, and Margarita, what they see is an open Mexico, supportive of free trade, democracy, and human rights in the world. This is very important. And they also looking, or they're, they're perceiving a Mexico that has to be a very important actor in the international system. What the previous government would say, um, an actor with global responsibility. All of them coincide in that Mexico has to act as a middle power, emergent power, or as a, as a, as a global actor in the world. Um, they believe Mexico has to be a leader in issues such as immigration, of course, 
drug trafficking, climate change, non-proliferation, and they have to be a lead, and it has to be a leader in Latin America, which is also something I will come back to um, later on. Um, in brief, they see an active role for Mexico in the world, a proactive foreign policy, as the pre says, and they also take, again, the discourse of diversification. I would not stress this very much because this is, you know, what they always do all the time, so this is not very uh, new, except for two major, or well, three major actors, very concrete. Europe, Latin America only regarding the Pacific Alliance, which all day coincide that the Pacific Alliance, which is a group of four Latin American countries promoting deep integration, free trade, um, open markets, etc., and of course Asia. There is no clear strategy regarding Asia, but everybody says Asia is really, really very important. <laughs> all they coincide in terms of improving Mexico's image abroad. It's, it's a huge concern. They know Mexico has a terrible image abroad. They you tend to refer to soft power to improve this image, but that's all. And Margarita Zavala, I want to emphasize this, uh, she is very concerned about values, and in this sense, values are democracy and human rights. So democracy and human rights has to be a very important issue in Mexican um, foreign policy. And uh, the second narrative, and the second narrative is only Morena. Morena and López Obrador. If you read what they have registered at INE, at the National Electoral uh, Institute, it is really surprising because it's a discourse that really reacts and contrasts to that of the uh, rest of the candidates. It's basically a sovereignty-based rhetoric. They are against what in Spanish is entreguismo, which is basically selling the country. Of course, they're, I presume, thinking about the United States. And they underline that Mexican foreign policy has to respect the Constitution. Probably you know we have some principles of foreign policy within the Constitution, and they emphasize this very, very much. Um, foreign policy should be based on principles, uh, support for decolonization. I don't know why, because I don't think there's any other country to decolonize now, but they want to decolonize someone. Um, judicial judicial uh, equality, juridical judicial equality among states, non-intervention, peaceful solution of disputes, and the defense of migrants. This is also, all candidates are, of course, really interested in the, the subject of um, immigration. Mexico should project historical values such as independence and freedom uh, Mexico should recover its belonging to Latin America, i.e., you know, as opposed to North America. And um, Morena will express its solidarity with all the just struggles of all peoples in the world for any people fighting for its sovereignty and self-determination. Mexico should not intervene in issues of democracy, such as democracy and human rights abroad, as long as Mexico, as Mexico does not improve into the domestic situation. And this is something that the ambassador who went to El Colegio um, uh, last week, who supposedly will be the next foreign minister, really underlined. Mexico should not take a position regarding democracy and human rights abroad, because Mexico has no legitimacy to do that. And this is really a contrast to the other narrative. The other narrative uh, um, is convinced that Mexico should do that and be a leader. Uh, so, and this is this is me. I think this second narrative is proposing uh, low-profile foreign policy, basically, as opposed to that of a global actor. I think there are, in this sense, two uh, a, a very clear uh, difference. Of course, the the question here is, as Guadalupe also said, what the margins of action will be in terms of Mexico's foreign policy. Mexico is and will continue to be, in my opinion, a divided country regarding many, many issues that have to be with the international, that have to do also with the international agenda. And we are a politically and economically weak country. And of course, we have the US, as always, uh, at the north. So that's also important. Third, relations with the United States. All candidates coincide in the need for a respectful relationship with the United States, and they have been very careful not to condemn the US directly. 
Morena, as I said, used the word entreguismo, which is very, very significant in my, in my opinion, in terms, I think, of the United States. Morena defends a relationship not based on subordination, intervention, and militarization, i.e. security and drug trafficking, as you know, we, we did uh, in consistency with uh, US policies. Relations with the US should be based on, re on respect and sovereignty and cooperation for development. The issues identified by Morena in the bilateral relationship are economic growth and employment, uh, to, fa to face basically the causes of immigration, of migration, Mexicans migrating to the United States, respect for human rights and labor rights of Mexicans in the United States, and the document does not explain how this is going to be achieved, in contrast to other documents from other candidates that do have the strate strategies to go on. Margarita Zavala, in, 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 secondly, um, she is the only one, well, her document is the only one that names Donald Trump, but very, very carefully, and I quote, despite Donald Trump's hate rhetoric, uh, we must be creative and work with different allies within and outside the American government to strengthen bilateral relationships, end of quote. The document identifies two major issues, migration and trade, not surprisingly, and as migration is concerned, Zavala emphasizes the defense of Mexicans in the United States <coughs> and the world, but mainly in the United States, and proposes to create a wide network so, so that immigrants can defend their own rights here in the United States. Mexico should not allow any abuse or discrimina discrimination by immigration authorities in the United States or any country, but we know that you know, she's referring mostly to the United States. And in terms of trade, she under, uh, supports NAFTA, and NAFTA should be negotiated and concluded. You know, there's no question about that. The Frente, the Frente Pan PRD, um, the Frente proposes to redefine Mexico's strategic relationship with the United States with a comprehensive approach and based on mutual dependence. This is really surprising that they recognize openly that we are dependent, but we have to do something positive about this dependence, which is mutual. Um, secondly, free trade agreements, no problem with that. They should uh, be concluded, you know, but including uh, immigration clauses you know, that will defend the rights of Mexicans here and uh, the environment as well. Thirdly, uh, the, the Frente proposes openly that Mexico should be lobbying in the United States to improve Mexico's position in topics like immigration, of course. Uh, then Mexico should empower the Mexican communities in this country, in, in the United States, by endorsing their agendas and strengthening their contribution to Mexico's interests. Um, it's the only document that mentions the dreamers. Mexico should support the dreamers and should do something to regularize more permanently DACA here. Um, and um, a new, this is the only document that proposes a new program of cooperation in security. It doesn't mention Merida Initiative, but we all know that's what they're referring. And you know, they're proposing to have this program to reduce violence and citizen insecurity in Mexico as a result of drug trafficking and weapons. You know, weapons from the United States to Mexico. And finally, the coalition, which is really surprising, this is the party in power, PRI, and they have very little on Mexico-US relations. I think, well, there is a reason for that. Uh, the document only states that relations between Mexico and the US should be based on respect and for Mexico's benefit. That's all they say. Of course, well, they mentioned protection of Mexicans abroad and trade, but that's it. No more than that, so probably it's just a cautionary me uh, measure uh, uh, from the, the government. Points to underline. It's not surprising that the two major topics for all candidates are immigration, Mexican migrants in this country, and trade. Uh, as Guadalupe said, there seems to be a consensus on trade. If you talk to the people who will be working with AMLO if he becomes uh, president, they're very happy with, na well, with negotiating NAFTA, with free trade, no, no risk of becoming Venezuela. At least that's what they say now. You know, so in terms of trade, apparently NAFTA will go on. The only person who can stop NAFTA is Donald Trump. 
not the Mexican uh, candidates. Um, regarding immigration, I also think we have to be careful with the proposals of the candidates because there are limits, clear limits of what the Mexican government can do here. One thing is to have a consulate and do protection work, and the other thing is to directly intervene in U.S. policies trying to empower Mexican communities. That may cause a problem not only in the U.S., no country in the world would accept direct intervention, but there is a still, you know, at least um, uh, a concern about Mexican migrants here. The real problem, however, is not necessarily Mexican here or immigration because very few Mexicans are now migrating. It's more Central Americans who are migrating into this country. The real problem is repatriation. And the documents did not mention anything about repatriation. And of course, it is a Mexican problem. Once we have the Mexicans back in Mexico, it is our problem to do something about them or <coughs> give them a job or um, whatever. So uh, this is very interesting, no, no mention of, of uh, repatriation, but you know, at least one of the documents mentions that <coughs> you know, some of the dreamers are going back and others are very, very fearful that they will be sent back, uh, but there's no really not mention about that um, in, importantly. As I said, trade, well, there seems to be a consensus. Even Morena is talking about NAFTA, renegotiating NAFTA. No, no, no position about canceling NAFTA from any of the documents. And as um, <coughs> Guadalupe and Alejandro said before me, Donald Trump has become an actor. It has become an incentive to exploit, exploit a more nationalist discourse, um, but more in rallies and interviews. You can see Lopez Obrador sometimes saying some, you know, stressing Mexico's nationalism, saying that, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be dependent or, or so much dependent on the US. But when it's, it comes to writing, they're very more, uh, more careful. They do not emphasize nationalism in a radical way. Um, there's no doubt that Morena's discourse is the most radical in that sense. But um, even so, just like the other candidates, Morena tends to use the word respect and equality and not a direct uh, condemnation of the US government. With reference to the wall, yes, the wall has given Peña a political you know, gift in terms of you know, defending sovereignty. However, he could not exploit more because of Trump's visit to Mexico. The legitimacy of Peña in defending sovereignty in terms of the wall, you know, it's, it's always the public opinion will react saying, well, yes, fine, but you did invite Trump to Mexico. So it's not very um, useful in terms of, of in, in the, the, the government. Peña lost a lot of credibility by inviting Trump um, to Mexico. And um, finally, um, a last question that Peter um, sent me, and it's um, a very difficult question. It um, refers to the strengths and weaknesses of Mexican foreign policy in the context of the election and, of course, for the next um, government. And in this sense, I, I am very sad that I only found weaknesses, <laughs> three weaknesses and one strength. So, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, weaknesses. I think the major, the major obstacle for an effective and successful foreign policy is Mexico's domestic situation. As long as we continue with the levels of violence, insecurity, um, economic difficulties, um, you know, differences in terms of political models, ideologies, it will be very difficult for Mexican foreign policy to be strong enough to be successful. In my opinion, there is no strategy to improve Mexico's image abroad that just improve things within the country, you know? This, this idea of an image is not an image, it's you know, what's happening in the country. Um, secondly, the United States, I'm not sure it just, it's just a weakness. It can be also an incentive for Mexican foreign policy, but of course we have huge uncertainties about the US in terms of what does the government of Donald Trump want in terms of US relations with Mexico. Traditionally, the interest of the U.S. was a stable Mexico, 
and a more or less prosperous Mexico. We're not sure what the U.S. wants in terms of Mexico these days. So that can be a weaknesses and that can be an incentive to be creative and do something um, effective. And the third thing that is also issue that can also be a weakness or an incentive is the fragmentation in Latin America. What, Mexi what, Mex what the Mexican government has tried to do is, well, since, since Trump became president, is to look for allies. And the first air, you know, place to look for allies was Latin America. But Latin America is also divided. So Mexico has been very active, for example, in the OAS, trying to do something in Venezuela. You know, this gives Mexico a role in the world, a, pl a visible place in the region. But at the same time, we are not opposing um, American interests. We are basically doing what, the, what um, the U.S. also wants in Venezuela. So in that sense, we have um, an incentive to, be, to do something in the world, but not necessarily to strengthen our position vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the United States. And that's it. Uh, my time is gone. So now I, I, I just want to say that the strength, I do think that we have a very good foreign service. So that would be um, a strength in terms of um, Mexican uh, foreign policy. And I just don't have time to, to speak a bit about diversification, but probably in question and answers, we can address that subject. So thank you very much. Fantastic session, absolutely stunning presentations on Mexico. I've been studying Mexico for half a century, and I've never heard anything quite so insightful and written as this series of statements by our distinguished colleagues. Uh, I'd like to go back to Alejandro and ask you to comment a little bit, Alejandro, on the um, impact of Donald Trump on issues in Mexican public opinion. Uh, I think in some ways, you know, Trump's exaggerations are a gift to the political establishment in Mexico because if you can show distance and um, opposition, this earns you political points. So it sounds as though there is a potential uh, political strategy which is not to say nice things about Donald Trump and to say critical things about Donald Trump and that that will score you political points. Is that correct? Well, Peter, I think there are many ways to, to look at it. I, I think that if we go back a few months ago, uh, the expectation was that Donald Trump was going to be a major factor in the election. Even though he continues to be the United States, NAFTA, the bilateral relationship, I think that Trump in general has become uh, less important, less central in the, cam in the campaign trail. That doesn't mean that it won't be a, a topic. I think that the second debate will focus more on international topics, or, or the third one, I, I'm not sure which one. Uh, but the first debate did not concentrate on foreign policy. It was mostly domestic politics. Um, so we will see how, how the Trump factor plays out. But I would say there are three, three features in the electorate. One is that... Um, the idea that the bilateral relationship has deteriorated is very broad. And it's not playing in favor of any of the candidates. I think that anger towards Trump or frustration toward Trump, towards Trump might slightly be uh, playing in favor of, of, of Lopez Obrador as part of this general anger that uh, Wallo was, was referring to. Um, in, in fact, if I can say something in parentheses there, Anger is, in the anger versus fear uh, uh, continuum that, that Wallo was, was pointing out, I think that it has shifted as well. We, we remember Lopez Obrador being particularly affected by the fear campaign in 2006 as the danger for Mexico, which mobilized the fears of a segment of voters that had contracted um, debt, credit, or mortgages, and who played, st played in favor of stability by looking at Lopez Obrador as a possible danger. When we ask the electorate now whether they think Lopez Obrador is a danger to the country, 
we have a very, very low percent of people who say so. This has shifted very, very radically from uh, 12 years ago and also maybe perhaps from 2012. Now, the, the other thing, if you, uh, I mean, I could come back to this, but there are certain issues beside, besides Trump that are also signifying possible policy shifts as well as says, but also effects on the electorate. Lopez Obrador is being very broad in, in, in his uh, policy remarks. For example, uh, crime, crime which is perhaps the first, if not the second, you know, one of the top two uh, topics for this election, one of the two, top two issues, after 12 years of frontal combat with the army to, uh, uh, against organized crime, uh, he comes up with a very vague uh, idea that has had Mexicans talking about it for the last two weeks that is called amnesty. We still don't know what he refers to and, and, and his, his um, uh, you know, campaign collaborators try to explain, we are trying to be evangelized about the amnesty, but it's still unclear both to, to pundits and to the electorate as such. Um, when it comes to corruption, the other big topic of this election, because much of the anger against this current government has to do with corruption, and corruption in general, not, not towards the government as such, but towards the political class. And let's remember that López Obrador has sold himself as not being part of that political class. He has been anti-establishment for, for many years. He comes with a general proposal of being honest at the top and suddenly causing this cascade effect in which functionaries and, govern, uh, and, and uh, uh, governing bodies will just keep honest. There is no uh, specific proposal on how to strengthen the rule of law. So we have amnesty, very vague, very general, it's an important topic, honesty at the top, and if we continue like that, we could get for example, into the civil and political rights topic that Wale was talking about. And also, AMLO is very, Lopez Obrador is very, I say AMLO because it's easier, but uh, I mean Lopez Obrador, it's, it's, it's a little vague about it. When you ask him about any minority rights, he says, let's, let's see what happens in the public consultation. And public consultation is the response to many other things. This doesn't seem to, you know, force him to go into details about what policy shifts we could see, and gives him, um, uh, leaves him in a general state of uncertainty about what he would do, uh, uh, bringing his support to a basic issue of trust in the anti-establishment option. So. I don't know if that says something. Uh, I think that the structural reforms during the, 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 Peña, the Peña government, the, the general, I think the more specific response here is to revert them <laughs> without any more details. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask one question. I'm going to point it at Anna, um, and then we'll go to the audience. Um, in 2006, one of the problems for Lopez Obrador was his association with Hugo Chavez. And it was often said in 2006 that a vote for Lopez Obrador is a vote for Hugo Chavez. That's what you're going to get. That doesn't happen now, I don't think. So does this not make it easier for Lopez Obrador to win that the political landscape of South America no longer offers this kind of counterexample? Yes, I think the idea of, um, of his links with Venezuela or you know, the, the threat that in a way he would do what Chavez or Maduro has done um, is helping him in Mexico and is not credible anymore. You know, the, the, the coalition, which is really surprising to me, keeps exploiting this campaign of Me AMLO as a danger to Mexico and no one believes it anymore. You know, so in that sense, um, and, it, and again, taking into consideration that um, Latin America is very fragmented, but then you have more rightist governments now in Brazil, in Argentina, in Chile, you know, countries which we, who we had very difficult relations at some point. This new shift in Latin America also give, in a way, you know, um, the idea that nothing is going to happen. You know, we're, we're going to remain in the same direction, more or less. 
So politics doesn't matter. What a relief. Exactly. <laughs> yes. I actually do want to ask a question of, uh, of Guadalupe. We have both studied drug trafficking uh, over the years. And uh, there was a time when there was pushback from Mexico on the war on drugs on the ground that the consumption of drugs takes place in the United States, uh, that we are the consumers, that we also grow 40% of the marijuana not to mention a whole bunch of the opioids and, and uh, laboratory drugs. So what is this about Mexico's fault? And is there pushback now? I haven't heard that kind of pushback. No, but the, the, the um, uh, political debate is going into different direction in Mexico on drugs. First, there is some uh, uh, social pressure for legalizing drugs or start flexibilizing uh, our laws in that. Uh, second, we already have an important consumption problem in some parts of the country and that is hitting some uh, uh, vulnerable groups like uh, young poor people. So uh, consumption is becoming a more uh, social concern. And uh, the, other, uh, the, the third thing is that the debate is on um, we have tried everything and nothing is, has been effective. What's the problem? And that's what uh, Lopez Obrador is trying to open, to open different ways of looking at the problem with this idea that we need more uh, uh, local type of approachment, social uh, prevention, and that kind of thing. So that's the way in Mexico things are being framed. Thank you so much, yeah. Uh, and also, it, 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 you know, it also brings the, U well, the U.S. is there, but foreign policy and our relation with the U.S. Most of the discourse is, well, particularly uh, in, from Morena, is we took the U.S. approach to, to fight against drugs, which is militarized of the fight, and we should do this. But then Lopez Obrador, just like Alejandro said, sort of said, well, you know, we can just cannot withdraw the, the, the armed forces immediately. So we will continue for, you know, one year, a couple of years, maybe, and then we will change the approach. But now he has realized that there is no way he can just, you know, take the army out of the streets and just leave with the situation as it is. And as you know, we don't have a police. So probably what he's thinking, but we don't know about this, is to really train a police to do this kind of um, work. Thank you so much. I want to open the questions to the audience and ask you simply to speak loud. We're not sure how these microphones work. My knowledge of 21st century technology is zero, as my college-age daughters will explain. Um, so please cooperate. I'll, I'll let Aaron uh, I'll, I'll run around part. like Phil Donahue and hand up the network. And given, given our time, should we take maybe two at a time or something like this? Well, we've got 20 minutes. We've yeah. got 20, yes. okay. Let's say, take two questions, ask for brief responses, I think that, that, and then we'll great. go on. Um, so I see one in the front row, and, and there, and then <laughs> Thank, thank you all very much. This is delightful. Um, and more uh, given the low approval ratings for the government, how involved is the electorate? You know, what what kind of turnouts do you expect in this election? Great. We'll take one more right here, and then that will give our panelists a chance. So I know that today we talked about um, the economy, international relations, security, corruption, dissatisfaction, and polarization and whatnot. And I know that was the same type of rhetoric that allowed PIS in Poland and Fidesz in Hungary and then the AFD most recently in Germany to take over in sort of right-wing populist parties. And I was wondering if you guys think or fear that Mexico may be heading down this path or if it currently is or what type of steps you may think Mexico would take for that. Great, thanks. And, and please, our, our guests can, can intervene okay, as they, as they on wish. A, but, uh, on turnout? Yeah. If popular approval is so low, what do we expect in turnout? Well, I can't I can start then. Excuse me. That's all. 
Yeah. 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 In, in terms of turnout, very, very quickly, um, in the last four presidential elections, we have had under 60% average. Uh, it was very high in 94, 76%. It has been in the 50s. I would expect this, this uh, election to have an engagement, an average engagement, and, and perhaps it doesn't have to do much with, with the low approval ratings, but with the possibility to make a change. I think that uh, if, if Lopez Obrador supporters have a feature that distinguishes them, is that they are very excited about the possibility of winning this one, and they are motivated. If you remember some of the polls in 2016, uh, especially those uh, conducted by Gary Langer for Washington Post, they showed something that most forecasters, I think, ignore, in my opinion. And it was the fact that uh, Donald Trump supporters were much more motivated, were much more committed with Trump than uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, supporters. That's something we're looking at in, in Mexico. The, the most committed voters, or, or at least supporters, are those that are behind Lopez Obrador candidacy much more than the pre-candidate, uh, uh, which is struggling to have to hold the pre together. Uh, yesterday's change in the pre-leadership signal, something like that. And especially the front candidate, which is sort of like the most unstable coalition uh, towards July 1st. So my guess is that the turnout will be somewhere be between 55 and 60 percent. That's an expectation from a pollster. Uh, the president of the National uh, Elections Institute, Lorenzo Cordova, recently says, say that he would expect 68 percent. I think he's being overly optimistic. Hopefully it will happen, but I think that's a very optimistic bet. As, as in regards to the right-wing parties, just a quick response. I think that there is some commonality, some uh, shared feature between those right-wing populists and the left-wing populists in Mexico, if I may call it like that, which is the anti-establishment uh, uh, environment. I think that much of the electorate's rejection to the current government, and also not just to the government, but the fact that the front coalition is not growing as we thought it would uh, a few months ago, tells you uh, how this discontent has channeled to the to the Lopez Obrador candidacy, and regardless of how big he is in his statements or how badly he can do in the debates, because the general impression was that he did not prepare for the debate, that he was not very articulate, that he did not make any propositions. Uh, well, he he just keeps growing in the polls. So we're looking at a at, at a left wing populist option, if if I can use that that label. Uh, uh, that is strengthened by this, by this anti-establishment anti feeling and uh, strengthened by the fact that Lopez Obrador has been criticizing this political class for many, many years. I think it's finally uh, paying off. Thank you. Two more questions? Yes, please. First of all, first of all thank you very much for such a, such a great event. So I wanted to go back to the whole foreign policy and specifically of Lopez Obrador. It sounded, it sounded to me from what was exposed, there's so many questions we could have here, but let me focus just on that one. Uh, it sounds very 70s, very 1970s, which perhaps has to do with his own uh, biography, political formation, everything else. If that's the case, and if it's the case that he becomes actual president, the timing seems very interesting when, as, as you were saying also, that uh, what perhaps Kirchner or even Lula represented, you know, 10 years ago, now perhaps Lopez Obrador would, would be occupying that space. Do you see that that could be the direction uh, or or not because of the U.S., because of NAFTA, because now the right swing in South America, how, how that would be a very interesting situation for Latin America if that is materialized. Great, was there one more person that wanted to, Mario, please. Thank you, my question has to do with the vote for, uh, from Mexicans abroad. Uh, does it matter? Is it gonna play a role? Two great questions, uh, please, as you wish. Yes, well, yes, thank you, exactly. You know, if you read the document, you will be surprised. You, you know, you go back to uh, probably the 60s and the Cuban Revolution and the Sandinista Revolution as well. But anyway, uh, yes, it, it, you, have, you get the impression of the 70s, yes and no. Yes, because of the kind of topics they will discuss, but no, in the sense that in, this, in the 70s, you know, they had this agenda, 
very different from the agenda we would have now, but Mexico was very active. And my question, I don't know, but my question or my sense, my suspicion, is that Lopez Obrador does not want a, an, an active Mexico. You know, he, he does not see Mexico as really an international leader, an international actor. I may be wrong, I may be completely wrong, but that's the impression I have. A very cautious Mexico, a very low profile foreign policy, and just defend your very specific interests regarding immigration in the US or negotiation, NAFTA negotiation if it's not concluded before. So that's the sense I get by reading the documents, by listening to his positions and the probably next uh, foreign minister. And in just one second, I want to be very provocative. Can I? Yes, yes. please do. Regarding the, regarding the last question, yes. The, the last question, you know, the leftist, pop, the, 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 the populism of the left or not. I just, you know, if, if, you, if we have political scientists, student, uh, students doing political science here, just to think if Lopez Obrador is really a left alternative or not. That would be my first question. Uh, and my second question is, are we sort of looking at uh, a leftist alternative or, again, a uh, 60s, 70s, pre, 50s, 40s? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, don't know. I think that the uh, Mexicans abroad vote is not going to count at all because of the this huge difference between the front runner and, and the rest. And, in the, and it's also a very small, tiny part of the electorate. In the past, uh, uh, almost very little, very few Mexicans living in the US had voted. So I, I, I don't see any, any important in, influence. Um, two things on foreign policy. Lopez Obrador feels it's not comfortable even flying. Okay, and he, yeah, he he doesn't speak any other language, and he he's going to be just focused in the huge domestic agenda he has, and he has already said that that the best foreign policy is uh, the, is domestic politics, uh, and he is convinced that he might travel once just coming to talk to Trump because he is so such a inspiring um, leader that he is going to uh, the, the only one able to make uh, Trump change his mind. So <laughs> he will be flying a commercial airline because Trump is going to buy the presidential uh, airplane. Mexican presidential. Wow. Great. We have time for about two more questions if people want to uh, throw in one or two more. There are rumors that um, Pemex is going to undergo a great big turmoil uh, regarding looking after their own national mineral interests. Do you know anything about that? And where do the candidates stand on that? Any other questions? I, I think I'd like to ask a question about um, about uh, indigenous movements in Mexico and, and Chiapas and so um, social justice has been put on the agenda this was the original anti-globalization movement probably in the world was the, the Chiapas Zapatista movement um, and it's been you know isolated into one part of Mexico but you know have, have any of the candidates picked up on this issue Actually, just what was my last comment before this so We'll say that there is a connection between domestic policy and international status. And Mexico's uh, key attribute has been that people like Mexico. It has soft power for lots of different reasons, ranging from guacamole to Corona beer to whatever it is, to soccer teams, etc. But Mexico's main power has been soft power. It doesn't have hard power. So the question is, what kind of costs in terms of soft power has has been have been paid? And can it be reestablished? I mean, I think from the beginning, of, from midway through the Peña Nieto administration, it really declined. And it's the power that Mexico has. Can it regain it? He let it go. As you wish. On the uh, Mexico's soft power, 
I think that uh, foreign policy has paid a, a, a cost, but not uh, but tourist tourism, not at all. Last year, Mexico received the, the uh, a record number of tourists, and uh, now it's I think in the sixth sixth position around the world. So we still have <laughs> um, tourism and, and, and soft power. And um, I think that Mexico is not in, a, in an anti-globalization mood. And nobody is talking about indigenous rights. Uh, there was this um, uh, independent candidate, an, an indigenous woman, but she was not able to uh, reach the, the, the threshold of uh, signs that she needed in order to be registered. And that's such a shame. But I don't see that issue playing any, any, any role here. And uh, regarding Pemex, um, well, there, as, as uh, Alejandro said, you know, concerning amnesty and corruption, etc., there is no clear, we really don't know what Lopez Obrador wants in terms of Pemex and the energy reform. Because one day he says, or he implies, that he wants to, to you know, to reverse the, um, the reform. And the other, he says, well, you know, just don't worry. This won't happen. And if it does, it will be legal. So probably he wants to, to reverse the, the, um, the, the reform, but through Congress, which I don't know if he will be able to do that. But again, if you go back to the document, to the Morena document, it's really surprising how it uh, underlines that the natural resources belong to the Mexicans, to the Mexican people. Which, as you know, this was this has a huge historical weight because it was Lázaro Cárdenas and you know the revolution, the Mexican Revolution before, saying that we owned the natural resources. So he seems to be against you know the idea of selling that those resources, but he doesn't mention Pemex um, in, in the document at least. But he does says that he will be he will have a very specific policy against the mining companies, the foreign mining companies that are now in Mexico. And these are mostly Canadians. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the few things I learned as visiting professor uh, at the University of Denver is you stop at 2 o'clock <laughs> because classes begin at 2 o'clock. So that said, I'm going to thank you all your wonderful listeners and auditors and analysts and uh, uh, members of this community, we appreciate your presence and I want to thank the thank speakers. You.